So this is the first class in um, the chapter four, rates of chemical reactions. Yeah, rates of chemical reactions. Now, to give you a brief story of what we've done so far, we started off with the idea of elements and substances, and we know that substances are made up of small particles. We call them atoms, and atoms are made up of uh, protons, electrons, neutrons. Yeah, then we did chemical bonding, where substances were broken down and new substances were made, uh, meaning ions, atoms of uh, metals and non-metals were to react to make compounds. It is that. Then we discussed uh, the fact that when a chemical reaction changes or takes place, there is things that take place with it. There is bonds that are broken, bonds that are formed, and overall the reaction has an enthalpy change. So, so far we've seen, uh, you know, the whole history of atoms and elements becoming compounds through bonding. And then we talked about various types of chemical reactions. Some of those chemical reactions were redox, some of them were acid bases. And then for all the reactions, there was an accompanying enthalpy change or energy change that we just solved for in the previous chapter. Now, this chapter is going to talk about how fast a chemical reaction that takes place. So basically, how fast, you know, is basically what we are going to talk about in this chapter. How fast does a chemical reaction take place? And how can I make it go slower or faster? Make it go slower or faster. That's a concern with this chapter. And to understand this, we've got to invoke the earliest ideas of the kinetic theory of particles. And in some cases, and in senior studies, this is in fact called uh, reaction kinetics. The, because it's based on the kinetic theory of particles. So I'm going to invoke the kinetic theory also here. And remember what is kinetic theory? It discusses mainly states of matter how particles are free to move and so on and so forth in the gaseous state and uh, uh, basically uh, in the solid state they are in a fixed position and the liquid state are free to move and in the gaseous state they are even freer to move. Which is why of all the types of particles, liquids and solids and gases react fast. You understand how, how, uh, how fast a uh, uh, reaction can take place or how you can make it go faster or slower you have to best first discuss how does we have to study now how does a reaction take place how does a reaction take place we will talk about that first and then we talk about how we can change the rate how we measure the rate so how does a reaction take place let's discuss that part first all right and then we talk about the uh, the, uh, the practical ways of measuring different rates of reaction. We'll see that also, absolutely. That's a practical aspect of it. How you could do it in the lab and ATPs and all that stuff in the real life also. But at the atomic level, at the, what we call the kinetic level, how do reactions happen? Now, reactions happen when particles touch particles. When I use the word particles in this chapter, understand I mean either atoms, or I mean molecules, or I mean ions. Because in some cases, ions react with each other. In some cases, atoms react with each other. Or in some cases, atoms react with molecules. And in some cases, ions react with molecules. So it's either of these three types of particles that react. So I am, for the sake of this chapter, going to talk, uh, going to call them particles. All right. So we're going to talk about how particles react and then how do they react with each other. So that's the focus of the first half of this class. How does a reaction take place? And I'm talking about, I'll be using the word particles to refer to the smallest units of our reactants. You know, in acid alkali react reactions, the particles were H plus ions and OH ions. You know, meaning for an acid and an alkali reaction, the real particles are H plus ion and OH minus ion reacting. For sodium and chlorine reacting to make the sodium chloride, let's say the ionic compound, the particles are atoms of the metal and chlorine gaseous molecules, you know, and uh, other reactions might have other kinds of particles. So we're going to talk about those. All right.
yes, I know this is not balanced. Let me say half CL2 to save everybody the embarrassment of the fact that I didn't mean to balance it. Didn't worry about balancing it. I was just giving an idea. So now, so what am I talking about here? I'm talking about the fact that let's discuss how reactions take place, right? That's the kinetics of reactions. So you now here, let's say for example, you know, I'm talking about, I'll take an example of HCl. Now, this is fun because you see, uh, let's say, and I'll take a simple example because this is the easiest one to use, one of the easiest ones. Because hydrogen and chlorine can react to make two moles of HCl as a gas. Literally, hydrogen gas can react with chlorine gas to make two molecules of HCl gas. And uh, this could be called reduction, redox, oxidation, or even just formation of HCl. So when this reaction takes place, you know, when we did the moles concept and we talked about, okay, this many grams and that many grams, remember that we would take large amounts of these things, which would mean there are billions and billions and billions of these particles that react. But at the, at the very granular level, so these, each of these particles, so each of these molecules in this case, they are molecules. So each of these molecules, which ones? H2 and Cl2 have to touch each other. Each other to react. Now, if you remember, we did the same reaction in bond energies. We talked about the fact that, you know, when they, when they have to react, the HH bond has to break, the CL-CL bond has to break, and then two moles of HCl bond have to make. If you remember, this is the part of bond energies. We discussed that HH bond has to break, CL-CL bond has to break, and two of these uh, bonds have to form. That's what's supposed to happen. And I'm saying this cannot happen unless these particles touch each other. They have to come into physical contact, individual particles for them to react. All right, first of all. So that means the particles, technically speaking, have to collide. This is called collision. It's called collision theory. The H2 and Cl2 have to collide. And why do they have to collide? They have to collide so that they can break their internal bonds, okay, and then form new bonds. All right. And at a very, very basic level, let me show you what's happening. This is called collision theory, guys, by the way. Collision theory. Now, here I'm going to show you the H and 2 colliding. The H2 and I2, Cl2, sorry. So this is a Cl2 molecule and this is an H2 molecule. These particles have to move towards each other. Now, they're in the gaseous state, so they are moving. But they move towards each other. They they look at them coming close, they're coming close, they start touching each other. Because they have to touch each other, they literally have to touch each other. Yes, why? Only then can this bond break between the Cl-Cl and the H-H, so that Cl and H can overlap. Then Cl and H can overlap. Their overlap has to be broken. So what's happening was that Cl-Cl was here and H-H was here, okay? Let's say I use another color for H, green for now. And so what happens is, I'll duplicate these guys. So now here they come really close. They have to touch each other. Why? So that they two can apus may bond. Meaning these two bonds have to be broken. They literally have to be broken. And two new bonds have to form. This is the bond breaking and the bond forming we talked about. So in the end, Cl bonds to H. So they come together, they touch each other, they collide, they react, and then they move away. This is the collision theory of reactions. Okay? Without particles colliding, you are not going to have a reaction. All right? It might seem very obvious to everybody now, but it wasn't so obvious early on. And now, yeah. So there, yeah? So... We, this is called collision theory and particles have to collide. Now, the funny thing is that in the real world, a lot of Cl2 and H2 molecules are going to collide every second. But most of them are not going to be successful collisions. Okay? 
there are many many collisions but only a small fraction of those collisions will result in a chemical reaction so you're going to have lots of collisions but you know you're going to have only you got to have sorry you got to have collisions and collisions and some of them of them will produce a reaction now i'll explain to you why they don't all produce a reaction but only some of them do and th those that do are given a technical term they are called effective collisions which means that i'll give you a fake example let's say you have a hundred molecules of hydrogen and chlorine and they're all moving at a certain speed you know first of all two chlorines can collide with each other also and two hydrogens can collide with each other also when the two hydrogens collide two chlorines collide their collision is not going to be successful even when to when hydrogen and chlorine collide not all collisions will be successful and there are two reasons for that we will talk about that but there, there are three things that have to happen for a reaction to take place one is they have to collide but not all collisions are successful only some of them are and we call them effective collisions now what that means is i mean what can be what would make a collision unsuccessful is if the bonds don't break or if they don't need in this orientation now we've studied we've studied some idea called minimum activation energy now the minimum activation energy is the energy required to break the bonds now the bond the molecules better have the energy from their own kinetics their own speed and if they don't have the energy then they won't break the original bonds so for a collision to happen they have to have enough energy to break their bonds that means these two molecules should have been moving so fast that the kinetic energy was enough to break their own bonds if it isn't enough then they don't have the minimum activation energy to bond but even if they have the activation energy to bond there's another reason why they're not successful is about what we call orientation so if h h and c l c l collide this way you know no reaction only if they collide this way there will be a reaction this is called the correct orientation so this orientation is correct meaning the way they're facing each other this orientation is the right orientation this is the wrong orientation and the reason for that is that it might be correct for these two but these two can't bond if they cannot bond they won't break their own bonds it has to be like this all right so for a reaction to take place they have to collide they have to have the minimum activation energy and they have to have the right orientation three things and that's part of collision theory of reactions basically an effective collision is the one that will that means a reaction took place meaning in that two mo uh, molecules reacting they made a product if they collided and there was no reaction there would be no product so they have to collide and if they make a product then that particular collision is called an effective collision so for example if these this orientation collides and they get h2hcl that's a successful collision this is the wrong orientation so this is a unsuccessful collision all right now many questions come to your mind and i understand that but the idea was let me give you a basic idea of orientation theory if anybody's ever done enzymes and the lock and key method the enzyme is providing the correct orientation for the substrate to bond without the enzyme there will be no correct orientation and there will be no reaction taking place so the none of this if you're asking me which of this will come in the exam none of this will come in the exam but if you don't understand this then you cannot apply this to things that will come in the exam okay so anyways forget the exam part of it for now okay could you it kind of doesn't matter right now at this the first 20 minutes of class should not be a question about an exam you know because it's an irrelevant question it has a history to give about the chapter for you to understand that so hence yeah
so we don't want to talk about the uh, the MC, exams MCQs yeah but I do want to talk about simply speaking that for a reaction to take place three things have to happen they must collide they must have energy lower than activation energy or greater than activation energy and they must co co collide in the correct orientation you know, right? these three happen have to happen so that you can have better effective collisions now why does this matter because when you start thinking about all the ways to improve the rate of reactions you can improve any of these three factors you see so one was one was the particles the reacting particles must collide second is they must have minimum ea and third is they have the correct orientation now o levels igcse is more mainly concerned only with the first two that there must be a collision and they must have some minimum activation energy but there's also yeah orientation that matters and so there are some factors that can increase this and there's some factors that increase this there's some factors that increase the collision frequency and some some who, who increase the effectiveness of collisions. That's the two things. And that's what we're going to work out. All right. So let's look at, first of all, so now there are two parts of the chapter. So if you understand collision theory, now there are two parts of the chapter how to measure rate of reactions that's experimental techniques how to measure rate and what factors affect rate and um, naturally speaking i think this one is gets done first only because i've started with collision theory now you can start with experimental theory then factors and then explain collision theory but I started from collisions, so I've got to do factors and then this. So, what factors affect rate? Now, understand the factors that affect rate will either do one of the two. Will either have to have to help with the um, will affect uh, either they can affect collisions or affect uh, effective collisions. Understand? There are two different things. Something's wrong with my writing today. Yeah. Okay. So you can have collision. You can actually just increase total collisions. So you can, you can really affect collisions, meaning you can have more collisions. Or you just can have the same collisions, but make them more effective. Understand there are two different things. So the way to change rate is to either change what we call either change collision frequency Make them either go slower or faster or, or change the proportion, meaning how many of the free collisions proportion are effective, proportion of effective collisions. So maybe if 10% were effective collisions, you want to make them 20% or 30% or 5%. So either you can make more of the collisions that already happen effective or just have more collisions overall both can affect rate so if you because think about this this is what i'm saying let's say you're having let's say just as a rough number let's say you are having a hundred collisions per second right and only 10 percent are effective or successful is the word right so how many are total collisions so at this stage what is the total effective collisions per second per second now i'm teaching this to make you understand this chapter because this chapter is constant in o levels as and a2 so you have 100 collisions and 10%. Let's, can we change the 10% to let's say 8%? 8% 8 
makes it a little better. No, 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 not eight percent. Sorry, let's change this to two hundred, not one hundred. So I have got two hundred collisions per second, but only ten percent of them are successful. So how many effective collisions are there? Ten percent of two hundred is twenty. Now, I am saying either increase the total collisions per second or decrease them or either increase or decrease the total collisions or increase this percentage either increase the collision frequency or increase the proportion of effective collisions so if this is scenario a let's say i say in scenario b i make this into 300 collisions per second now we'll talk about hey how can you do that and i'll tell you in a second but let's say I somehow I can make instead of 200 collisions, I make them 300 collisions. But only still 10% are successful. Now how many collisions do you have per second? Successful. My, my English has gone to the dogs right now. So total that becomes 30 per second. Yeah, we all get that? Awesome. Here, you've gone from 20 collisions per second successful to 30 collisions per second successful. So now you're making, instead of making 20 units of the product, you're making 30 units of the product per second. So you're making more per second, so the rate is increasing. Yeah? So here, the proportion does not increase. Scenario B, I did not. So in scenario B, I only changed the frequency. I did not change the proportion of effective collision. All right. I only changed the frequency. So I only went from 200 to 300. It's still only 10%. You're absolutely right. I didn't change it. Absolutely. But now I'm going to change it. Increasing number of collision just leads to more results. Yes. So uh, the only, I mean, either, because look, the end goal is having more successful collisions. Either you can just have more collisions, so that means more successful collisions. Or you can say, you know what, let's keep them at 200 collisions because you need to understand that this change from 200 to 300 is because of a certain factor. We'll talk about that in a minute. But let's say I said, you know what, no, 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 no. Let's try a certain scenario C, where I still have only 200 collisions okay, per second, total collisions per second. But now, let's say 15%, no, not 15, me. let's take a crazy number. Let's take 18% are effective or what we call successful. Now, in this scenario, What's the total effective collisions per second? Is how much? 36 per second. So now, amongst the three scenarios, I keep giving you numbers that seem to keep increasing the rate, right? So comparing A to B, in B, I just made them, made them have just more collisions somehow. So one fact, so some factors that we'll study that help us increase collisions and some other factors keep the collisions the same, but increase the proportion of collisions. So meaning they're still having as many collisions, but more of their collisions are now successful, which means more product is going to form. Okay. Now, we are going to give you the factors are part of the syllabus. You might have already heard of these factors before. The factors are temperature, pressure, concentration, surface area, and catalyst. Some of those factors affect things like scenario B. Some call scenario C. But these numbers 200, 10%, 20, 15, 18, 300 are made up by me to, ex to quantify for you what's happening. Because understand, this is physical chemistry. 
I feel, I feel bad when teachers don't put enough of numbers to this and make it so qualitative. It's actually quantitative. You can do the math. And anybody who gets basic arithmetic, when you get the math of it, everything becomes easy to understand because obviously that makes sense. You've seen the numbers yourself. So here, some factors go from A to B. And we'll, we'll discuss them soon. But they include things like temperature, pressure, concentration, yeah. But others include this. So catalysts, surface area, temperature. All of them do this. So some cause the effectiveness to be better, while some cause the rate to be better. And I'll give you everyday examples of this stuff that you can, can you think of a reaction where uh, just by anything in everyday life, just by heating something, it's going to just react faster, you know? Anybody comes, anything comes to mind? Yeah. Cooking is a great example of how you heat something and the heating, in fact, makes the particles move much more. And you might wonder, well, how does heat affect speed? And we'll talk about that. Heat affects kinetic energy because heat energy gets converted to the internal particles kinetic energy, which therefore results in higher speed. Pressure and temp concentration get the particles closer together, you know. And uh, I'll give you an idea. I'll give you an idea. Like, if somebody were to, let's say, squirt a bottle of perfume in a small bathroom and you're next to them, the reaction, which is you smelling them, will be faster. But if they squirt a bottle of perfume in a big mall and you're on the other end of the mall, you might never really get to smell the perfume. You might say, well, it's diffusion, but diffusion leads to a reaction between the, uh, there's a reaction between the perfume molecule and your uh, receptors in your body. So the receptors react with the perfume molecules. The reaction happens faster if you sniff more of the perfume. There are so many smells happening on a daily basis that you never really get to effectively register because the quantity of those molecules in your nose coming are too little. But when they're too many, you register. That's concentration. And catalysts and surface areas, they actually increase effectiveness. So we'll talk about all of them. Okay? Apply to him. So catalysts actually just, all of these are affecting rate. But catalysts affected by making the more effective collisions or more successful collisions. Pressure concentration are only about having just more of the collisions in the first place. Because what's the pressure going to do and what's the concentration going to do? You're going to have more of these particles colliding. That's what concentration does. Let me show you some examples now. But getting back here for a second. So this is what concentration does. What does concentration mean? Okay. Now here's an example of, you know, we've done this reaction. You've done calcium carbonate reacts with, let's say, HCl to make calcium chloride, carbon dioxide, and hydrogen gas. Now, here is an example of a lower concentration solution. I hope you can see this, all right? Okay. Here's an example of a lower concentration solution. And here's an example of a higher concentration solution. Okay. Now, because you a lower concentration means less particles per unit volume. A higher concentration means more particles per unit volume. So this means that if even if all were to collide per second with this guy, you'd maximum have like five collisions per second with this lump. But here, these guys are so close that they can have 15, 20 collisions per second. And basically what does what it means is, what does this that Higher concentration, what it does is, it increases the frequency of collision. Not 
द प्रपोर्शन ऑफ सक्सेसफुल कलेजन बट द फ्रीक्वेंसी ऑफ कलेजन सो इवन इफ ओनली टेन परसेंट आर सक्सेसफुल जस्ट बाई इंक्रीजिंग द कलेजन फ्रीक्वेंसी टेन परसेंट ऑफ मोर कोलेजन आर सक्सेसफुल यू सी एंड द सेम कैन बी अप्लाइड टू प्रेशर फॉर गैसेज बिकॉज वन थिंग यू गॉट रिमेंबर concentrate what concentration is for liquids is pressure for gases literally that if concentration is particles per dm cube pressure is collisions per cm cube but collisions can only happen because of more particles so the same idea can be applied to gases so if gases have to react like this you know let's say this is nitrogen and hydrogen reacting now in both cases which Two are gonna have. Which of the two do you think the left or the right are gonna have more collisions per second? Which of the two gonna have more molecules colliding with each other per second? It's so obviously the right one. So higher pressure also increases frequency of collision. So both concentration. and pressure do that they do what they increase the frequency of collision so these are two factors that affect rate i have done all of them but i have done the first two so concentration and pressure these are two factors that affect rate how by changing the frequency of collision and the other three factors surface area and uh what surface area also increases collision we'll talk about that but i got i need more time for that so i'm going to do that in the next class all right i'm going to wrap this up here concentration and pressure so what have we done today as a recap you need collision theory you need to know the particles have to touch each other to touch each other to collide they have to touch in the right orientation and they have to have the minimum energy which is what we call activation energy when they do all three is when they have a successful collision but if they just collide and don't react that can happen also so not all collisions are successful only some of them are that have the minimum activation energy and have the right orientation and so by helping either increase the frequency of collisions which is these two guys definitely do it and also by increasing the proportion of successful collisions we can have reactions occurring faster or slower just by changing them and that's going to be the lesson for the second class in this chapter i'm going to wrap this up right now right here all right